Persephone Infirmary, 1957. So, if I volunteer to be a test subject for these plasmid experiments, said the man with scars on his wrists, I'll be let out of here. Carl Wing shrugged. Sure, I, I got that part, but won't I just end up locked up in some other place in Rapture? Sophia Lamb hesitated. She was sitting with a therapy subject in the small, overlit, metal-walled Persephone infirmary. And as the lank-haired, nervous little man in the prisoner's jumpsuit looked trustingly at her, she suddenly wanted a cigarette. She'd given up smoking, but right now she would have paid a great many rapture dollars for a single smoke. But he was looking at her with his sad green eyes, and she had to respond. Um, y yes, in a way, she admitted, remembering to smile. You'll be in a, in a research facility, but you'll be able to help the cause there. In time, it will give your life meaning. You did say, Coral, that your life felt meaningless, that you had no identity here in Persephone, that the words died on her lips. She just couldn't go on. It all sounded so hollow. She was proposing to play Sinclair's game and send this man to be an experimental subject. And she thought about Eleanor, her own child, the subject of experiments, somewhere in rapture. I lost my way, Sophia realized. She'd been working with other prisoners in Persephone, partly to get the warden, Nigel Weir, to trust her, and partly to indoctrinate the patients with her philosophy. She was creating moles who would be activated when she sent them the prearranged signal as part of her scheme to escape Persephone and overthrow Ryan. The therapy sessions with Persephone prisoners under the auspices of working for the warden had seemed necessary. Part of the deal was prepping some of them for Sinclair's experiments. But abruptly, it had become unbearable. And as she realized that, another realization swept over her, like water crashing through a collapsing seawall. The moment has come. She cleared her throat and said, Ahem. <clears throat> Carl. We're going to change course here, you and I. You won't have to volunteer for experiments. If you want to help our cause, then simply go to your cell and wait till the doors unlock and you hear the signal we talked about. The butterfly is taking wing. Then head for the guard's tower. Overwhelm anyone who tries to stop you. He gaped at her. The, the tower? Really? When did you decide? She shrugged and smiled, ruefully. Just now, I felt the movements of the body, the true body of rapture. Truth is in the body, Carl. The body is speaking to me, speaking through me, and it's deciding that the day has come. Now go, and don't speak of this to anyone. Wait for the signal. He nodded eagerly, his eyes shining. She went to the door, called for the guard, and had Carl escorted back to his cell. She didn't need an escort herself. She had a pass that allowed her to move freely from one part of Persephone to another, so long as she didn't try to leave the facility. But today, she decided, as she strode down the corridor, she would become the one issuing passes. She would make the move for which she long prepared. She prepared for this day, but she hadn't felt ready till this moment. It wasn't just Carl or the others like him. It was the thought of Eleanor. The painful fact of Sinclair and his scientists warping the girl's powerful but innocent mind. She could bear it no longer. Sophia looked at her watch. Simon Wales, the most enthusiastic of her highly placed converts, should be coming for his visitation now. Perfect. And no coincidence. The true body of Rapture had planned it all. The body is truth. Truth is in the body. Would Simon have the courage to do as she asked? Many times he'd claimed he would do anything. Anything, she asked of him. Today, that claim would be tested. She arrived at her cell, leaving the door open, in keeping with her special privileges. 
the same privileges that made it possible for her to receive Simon Wales here. He arrived in under a minute, looking fatigued but resolute. Dr. Lamb. His eyes seemed feverish. He was dressed in a priest's garb, she noticed, complete with collar, and he'd grown out his beard. The butterfly-shaped brooch he wore clipped to his shirt pocket was a bit out of place, but it signified he had emerged from the cocoon to become one of Lamb's flock, the flock of butterflies, but butterflies with wings of razor-sharp steel. Have you become a priest, Simon? Sophia asked, glancing up the corridor towards the other cells. I'm a priest of your church, Dr. Lamb, he said hoarsely. He ducked his head in submission to her. Then you are ready to do anything for the cause of the body. His head snapped up, his eyes glinting hotly, his hands clutching and fisting. I am. The day has come. I cannot wait any longer. Thinking about Eleanor and all that I have had to do here, I simply cannot wait another moment. But Sinclair is here. I saw him go into the Persephone control tower. Shouldn't we wait till he's gone home? It doesn't matter. Warden Weir will send him out at the first sign of trouble. She smiled. The Warden, too, awaits my signal. She lowered her voice to a whisper. You'll take this pass from me. She took it from around her neck and hung it over his. Go to the tower. Show the cameras the pass. They'll unlock the tower. You'll step inside and shoot the guards there. Then throw the emergency cell unlock switch. We've already discovered its whereabouts. I remember, he said, licking his lips. When the cell doors pop open and the cell block doors with them, you'll get on the public address system and announce, The butterfly is taking wing. That'll be the signal. His voice quivered with hushed excitement as he said, Yes, oh thank God. The signal to set you free. I will take Persephone over, but I won't leave here immediately, till we have complete control of the area. We'll send for our followers to surround the area and protect us. When the time comes, I'll go find Eleanor. Meanwhile, this place will change from being my jail to being my fortress. And the gun? The gun you'll need is hidden in the utilities locker. You remember the combination? I do. She squeezed his hand. Then go. He turned and rushed from the cell, showing not a flicker of hesitation. He would either die in the control tower, or he would do the job. Simon was no gunman, but he'd been practicing, as per her orders. And with a little luck, as well as the element of surprise, Sophia waited, tensely, on the edge of her bunk, wringing her hands, thinking about Eleanor. Within ten minutes, the other cell doors suddenly clanged open, released from within the tower. A uniformed Persephone guard looked around in confusion. What the hell's going on? Simon's voice boomed from the Persephone public address. The butterfly takes wing. You know what to do. The butterfly takes wing. The prisoners responded with gleeful howls of men, suddenly set free their long pent-up fury expanding like a released spring. She listened to the scuffling turmoil as the prisoners rushed from their cells and swarmed over the guards. She winced as shots were fired, but Sinclair's prison constables were quickly overwhelmed. There was some shouting, hooting, two more gunshots, screams, inarticulate cries of triumph. An alarm warbled and suddenly cut off. Sophia took a deep breath and stood up deciding it was safe to come out of her cell. She stepped into the corridor, was met by Simon Wales, who was grinning with wolfish delight as he rushed up to her. A pistol smoked in his right hand. His left hand was red with blood. We have Persephone, he crowed. Sinclair has fled, the guards with him, the ones we didn't kill. Weir is still here, but he says he'll take your orders. It's all yours, Dr. Lamb. You're in control of Persephone. Hephaestus, 1957. Bill McDonough hummed along to the Andrews sisters' song playing over the PA system as he tightened the solemnity sleeve. 
The song suddenly switched off, replaced by Andrew Ryan's sonorous voice, one of Ryan's canned speeches. What is the greatest lie ever created? said Ryan over the public address in his deepest intonation. There was a treacherous intimacy in that voice, like a quietly angry father. What is the most vicious obscenity ever perpetrated on mankind? Slavery? Dictatorship? No. It's the tool with which all wickedness is built. Altruism. Bill sighed to himself. He was no great believer in charity, but if people wanted to extend a helping hand, that was their business. Ryan's fierce rejection of altruism had been there all along. Lately, with a whole class in rapture suffering, it was starting to grate. Whenever anyone wants others to do their work, Ryan went on, they call upon their altruism. Never mind your own needs, they say. Think of the needs of whomever, of the state, of the poor, of the army, of the king, of God. The list goes on and on. Roy, Bill muttered, and so do you, Mr. Ryan. Go on and on, that is. He glanced over at Pablo Navarro, working across the room with a clipboard. Might be a mistake saying that kind of thing out loud, but Pablo seemed focused on writing down heat readings. From the speakers near the ceiling, almost from the very air, Ryan went inexorably on. My journey to rapture was my second exodus. In 1919, I fled a country that had traded despotism for insanity. The Marxist revolution simply traded one lie for another. And so I came to America, where a man could own his work, where a man could benefit from the brilliance of his own mind, the strength of his own muscles, the might of his own will. Now that view, Bill thought, using a tiny screwdriver to adjust the filter, was something he could appreciate. It was a view that had helped bind him to Andrew Ryan, a man being judged on what he'd achieved, what he could do, not on class, religion, race. Surely they were going through a rough time in Rapture, but he still had faith that Ryan's grand vision would see them through. Quiet rage simmered in Andrew Ryan's voice as he went on. I thought I'd left the parasites of Moscow behind I thought I'd left the Marxist altruists to their collective farms and their five-year plans. But if the German fools threw themselves on Hitler's sword for the good of the Reich, the Americans drank deeper and deeper of the Bolshevik poison, spoon-fed to them by Roosevelt and his new dealers. And so, I asked myself, in what country was there a place for men like me? Men who refused to say yes to the parasites and the doubters. Men who believed that work was sacred and property rights inviolate. And then one day the happy answer came to me, my friends. There was no country for people like me. And that was the moment I decided to build one. Rapture. Ryan finished his speech and the music came back on. Cheerful Boogie Woogie played. Yeah, he decided to build Rapture, Navarro said wryly as he came over to write down readings on the meters near Bill. He built it, he gave us the come hither, acting like it belonged to us too. But it's all his, really, Bill. You ever noticed that? Bill shrugged, glancing nervously at the door. This was pretty seditious talk, the way things were lately. Mr. Ryan did use his own money to build Rapture, he said, wiping grease from his hands with a rag. My way of thinking, we're all leasing space from him here, Pablo. Some have bought space, but Mr. Ryan still owns most of Rapture, mate. He has a right to think like Rapture belongs to him. Yipped like a true lapdog, Navarro muttered, walking away. Bill stared after him. Pablo, Bill called out. Mind what you say to me, or I'll crack you one across the visa. Pablo Navarro turned to him gave a twisted little smile, and simply walked out of the room. Frank Fontaine's office, Neptune's bounty, rapture, 
1957. Late night in rapture. Frank Fontaine sat at his desk in a cone of yellow light, writing busily, chuckling to himself now and then. A forgotten cigarette going out spiraled smoke from a seashell ashtray. A pint of bourbon stood beside the ashtray. He had used it to sweeten the cup of coffee that had long ago gone cold. Fontaine worked with pen, paper, and an open book, poring over the account by John Reed of the lives of Soviet idealists, a book he'd had to smuggle into rapture, and he was getting lots of juicy material for his Atlas pamphlets. Just a paraphrase here, a change in terminology there, and presto, he'd soon have the Atlas Manifesto. Of course, he'd borrowed from Sophia Lamb, too. She still had her followers, and with luck, they'd become his followers when the time came. Hearing a soft whistling, Fontaine glanced up nervously towards the door. One of his guards was strolling by the window of his office, Tommy gun in hand, whistling in tune to himself. Getting jumpy. He poured a little more bourbon into the coffee, took a mouthful, and grimaced. He set to scribbling again. Who is Atlas? He is the people, the will of the people in the form of... The sound of the door opening prompted him to close the notebook. He didn't want anybody to know about Atlas who didn't have to. It was Reggie, closing the door behind him. Well, boss, we done it. Up in Apollo Square. Three of them. Three? Are they all good and dead or just shut up a little? Reggie nodded, tapped a cigarette from a pack. They're dead, boss. Three dead cops lay inside by side. He lit the cigarette and flicked the match so that the little trail of smoke arced to the ashtray. Cops. <laughs> Those half-assed constables aren't cops. They're bums with badges. Far as I'm concerned, all cops are bums with badges. Anyhow, we nailed them. They never knew what hit them. I shot two of them myself. He blew smoke at the light bulb. Boss, I don't like to question your, uh, strategy. Hell, you own a big piece of this wet old town. But are you sure hitting these constables is going to get you what you want? Fontaine didn't respond immediately. He knew what Reggie was really asking. What is the strategy? Fontaine reached into a drawer, found a tumbler, poured Reggie a drink. Have a drink. Relax. Reggie took the glass, sat in the little chair opposite the desk, raised his drink to Fontaine. Cheers, boss. He gulped half of it. Woo, needed that drink. I don't like shooting guys in the back. Doesn't sit right with me. Fontaine grinned. Just imagine how Ryan will react to it. He'll know it was me, but he won't be able to prove it. It's just enough, though to give him the excuse he needs. I can almost hear his speech to the council now. You sound like you want Ryan to come after you, boss. Maybe I do. Maybe I want to go out guns blazing, because that'll open up a whole new playground for me. You know me, Reggie. You know I can't stay Fontaine forever. First time I heard you say it since you've been here. I haven't got the muscle to take over Rapture without Rapture's help, without its people helping me, Reggie. You got some kind of revolution in, in mind? Civil war and revolution. I'm pushing Ryan with the smuggling, rubbing it in his face. I gave him his chance to let me have Rapture my way. He didn't go for it. Now we bait the trap. See, people stand by him because he's the shining example, right? But if he breaks all his own rules, does a corporate takeover, acts like a dictator, that'll turn people against him. And they'll need someone to guide them. You get it? I haven't got the power to hold him off for long any other way. So I dig a hole, cover it up, and let him rush into it. But you could end up getting killed in this little war, boss. 
I'm counting on it. Frank Fontaine has to die. But I'll still be here, Reggie. Reggie laughed softly and raised his glass. Here's to you, boss. You're the one. You sure as hell are. Apollo Square, 1957. The lights were dimming for evening over the Colosseum-sized space of Apollo Square. The enormous, four-faced clock hanging from the center of the ceiling showed eight o'clock, as Andrew Ryan said, This simply cannot continue. His voice was low and grating. Bill nodded. Right enough, Gov, he said softly. He was thinking of the hangings. But Ryan probably meant the chaos that had been surging up lately in Apollo Square and Pauper's Drop in other parts of Rapture. Pistols holstered under their coats, Andrew Ryan, Bill McDonough, Kincaid, and Sullivan stood together just inside the opening of a passageway that led out into Apollo Square. Karlowski was behind them, down the corridor, watching the back way. Head Constable Cavendish and Constable Redgrave were standing a few paces to the right and left, both carrying Tommy guns. Rising up the brass-trimmed Art Deco ornamented walls to either side of the doorway were the sleek sculptures that had once reminded Bill of hood ornaments, elongated silver figures of muscular men reaching for the sky with rocket-like verticality, holding up the ceiling in the process. To the left, yellow lettering on a scarlet banner read, The Great Chain is Guided by Your Hands. But it was the hanged men across from them that captivated their attention. Ryan was making his monthly inspection of Rapture. We've had repair crews in here working on leaks, Bill said, and the constables did a good job of protecting them, nicking mad splicers, punging them in the dingley dell, but it's getting right crowded in there, and in the morgue, I mean. Just take a butcher's at that. Hard to uh... <laughs> He chuckled to himself. He'd almost used the cockney rhyming slang. Hard to Adam and Eve, meaning hard to believe, but that would be a pretty confusing expression in Rapture. Hard to believe it's come to this. Standing in an open space just inside the further doors was a crude wooden platform and on a T-shaped gallows made of planks pulled up from around Rapture. Bill had seen the gaping holes where the planks had been the day before. From each arm of the T, a man's body hung. Apollo Square stank, too. It stank of dead bodies. There were five of them Bill could see, four men and a woman. The corpses scattered widely about the big room, sprawled awkwardly in brown puddles of dried blood, and there were the two hanged men, slowly turning on the ropes at the far side of the big room. The tram tracks were intact. There was no train running at the moment. As far as Bill knew, the trains were still running. At Artemis Suites, faces peered out at them from the darkened recesses of the doorway. Trash lay about the square, some of it stirring in the ventilator breeze. Music played from somewhere, So distorted, Bill couldn't make out what it was at first. Then he recognized Bessie Smith. She seemed to be asking to be sent to the electric chair. Laughter cackled maniacally from the ceiling. Bill looked up to see a spider splicer creeping across, upside down beside the big windows. Maybe you can bring him down, Cavendish, Sullivan said, glowering up at the splicer. I don't know how good that Tommy gun is at this range, but... No, Ryan said suddenly. It is not against the law to use Adam. It is not against the rapture law to walk on walls or ceilings as long as you don't damage them. If he breaks a serious law, shoot him down, but we're not going to shoot them like rabid dogs out of hand. Some of them are employable. Hey, Kincaid? Kincaid sighed and shook his head doubtfully. Employable? Only sometimes, Mr. Ryan. Offer him Adam, they can be persuaded to use telekinesis, move the bigger parts about for us, but they get distracted. 
and fight too much. A couple of them were supposed to be moving pipes into place, ended up throwing them at each other like spears. One of them impaled right through, took a long time to get the pipe clean afterward. Ryan shrugged. Adam will be controlled in time. He paused thoughtfully and went on. As for the rogue splicers, we will only kill those we have to kill. We're going to control them, and we're going to have some strict rules. We will end the vigilantism. We will end the vandalistic graffiti. We will stop people from getting into lunatic fights with one another. We won't tolerate these oafs blasting out flames without thinking. Disruptive fires starting. Burned up one of my splendid new curtains at the metro station. How do we get rogue splices under control, Gov? Bill asked. He took a deep breath, his face hardening with determination. For start, we are going to enforce a curfew. We'll require identification cards at checkpoints. We will increase the presence of security turrets and security bots at key points. Ah, speak of the mechanical devil. Daemon ex machina. He smiled wryly. Two security bots whirred around the edges of the voluminous room, flying side by side, miniature self-guiding helicopters, each about the size of a fire hydrant, but blockier with built-in guns. They made Bill nervous. He never trusted the bots not to shoot him, since they were machines, even though he and the others wore identification flashers that told the bots they were friends. He ducked as the robots flew by, always afraid their whirring copter blades would slice into him if they came too close. The choppering security bots continued on their way, circling the big room, watching for anyone who might threaten Ryan and his entourage. Then the full import of Ryan's words began to sink in. Hey, go. Did you say curfews? Checkpoints? You mean all over rapture? Hadn't Ryan always claimed that that was the kind of thing the communist dictators pulled? Yes, Ryan said, gazing balefully at the bodies twisting on the gallows. Everyone will have an ID card. They must restrict themselves to authorized areas, and the ID cards will tell us where they're supposed to be. There'll be a curfew until further notice. We'll have to institute the death penalty for more crimes. We can all see for ourselves how tough the situation is. And we're losing population. We'll have to recruit new people to catch up. Meanwhile, we've got to get things stabilized. We'll have to set up a serious, large-scale raid to take Fontaine down. We're going to destroy him this time. And take over his business. For the good of Rapture. Run it responsibly. Bill was stunned. Take over Fontaine's business. But doesn't that kind of run against the whole spirit of Rapture? Ryan frowned. Sometimes we have to fight to protect that spirit, Bill. Look what happened. Right here in Apollo Square. Three constables shot dead. We're going to see to it that all the enemies of Rapture are caught and punished. Bill felt disoriented. Almost dizzy. Ryan was sounding more like Mussolini than a man who advocated pushing out the limits of human freedom. You plan to take over Fontaine's plasma business by force? That's not exactly the free market at its best, Mr. Ryan. No, no, it isn't. But Fontaine's threatening rapture with destruction. The whole colony will fall apart if we don't act, Bill. He wants chaos. He wants it because for a demagogue of his sort, preying on the weakness of the masses, chaos is opportunity. Chaos is the fertile ground where the likes of Fontaine will sow the seeds of power. Lamb's followers thrive on it too. I concur, said Kincaid, nodding. We, we've had enough chaos. You have to draw into some prescribed limits sometimes. It's time to get rough to take the offensive. Bill found himself wondering if Ryan's shift into the offensive might be 
exactly what Fontaine wanted. Were they playing into Frank Fontaine's hands? Atrium near Fontaine Futuristics, 1958. Hey there, fellas, said the cheerful voice on the PA system. Frank Fontaine listened to it abstractedly as he walked across Fontaine Futuristics to training and extraction. You know that nine out of ten ladies prefer athletic men? Why stay on the sidelines when the new sport boost line of plasmid tonics can turn you into the jock you always wanted to be? Come and visit us at the Market Plaza for a free two-hour trial. You'll appreciate the difference. And she will, too. Fontaine struggled inwardly to banish the squirming discomfort, the trapped feeling that rose up in him when he walked up to a restricted area. No reason to feel trapped, he had two good bodyguards with him. You needed two nowadays. There was Reggie, and there was Naz, the grinning swarthy splicer looking like a mad Jesus with his long greasy hair and curly brown beard. He wore stained fishery worker coveralls his twitchy hands fiddling with that curved fish gutter he liked to carry. Naz was proof you could train a splicer, keep them in hand, sort of. He was big on the sport boost plasma, it took way too much of it, but it kept him alert. Fontaine knew he should feel safe. Lately, though, the closer he got to the little sisters, the more trapped he felt. The public address announcement coming on that moment wasn't helping. The woman's soothing voice was saying, The Little Sisters Orphanage. In troubled times, give your little girl the life that she deserves. Boarding and education free of charge. After all, children are the future of rapture. Orphanages. It had suited his sense of irony and maybe fed his bitterness to create an orphanage. Signaling Reggie and Naz to wait out in the hallway, he went through the double doors, the security bots rising up in the air at his approach. The bots scanned him and drifted away, worrying to themselves. A few strides more and automatic turrets, looking like swivel chairs equipped with guns, swung to take him out, recognized his flashers, and settled back down. Fontaine went down the hall to the little nursery-like cells where the girls were kept awaiting implantation and harvesting. He looked through the window in the door and saw two children playing with a wooden train set on the floor of the rose-colored room. The little sisters developed a strangely uniform look in their little pinafores. Their face and bodies remarkably similar thanks to a side effect of the sea slug implantation. The sea slugs were like tapeworms inside them. They're not human anymore, he told himself. After all, if you cut one of those kids, they instantly stopped bleeding. Cut off one of their little fingers, and the finger grew back, like she was some kind of lizard. The atom repaired them. That wasn't human. They were superhuman, almost. They didn't seem to get any older, either. They were in some weird state of growth stasis. Bridget Tenenbaum came drifting up to him. She had that ghostly look about her again, like a stiff ventilator breeze might blow her away. Maybe he needed to resume their sexual relationship, but she was the one making excuses lately, which was fine with him. She looked through the window at the little girls. They seem okay, he remarked. I always worry we're gonna get an inspection in here. People are gonna think, oh, them poor little tykes, but they don't seem unhappy. Tenenbaum only grunted, staring through the window. She took a cigarette from a pocket of her white lab smock and a holder from another pocket, united them, and put the holder in her mouth. Fontaine lit it for her with his platinum lighter. She blew the smoke in the air, but still said nothing. The hollowness in her eyes, the gauntness in her cheeks, making Fontaine think she was not so far from a little sister herself. He went on, mostly to fill the silence. But then, we get people so broke in rapture now, they just turn their kids over to us. <sighs> the children, 
are not unhappy as such. Tenenbaum said, her speech carrying cigarette smoke slowly into the air. Not in the usual sense of unhappy children. They barely remember family. Their minds, their minds are strange. The atom, the sea slug connection, these make them strange. I find being around them very, <clears throat> very uncomfortable. Even with those things implanted in their bellies, they are still children. They play and sing. Sometimes they look at me and they smile. He glanced at her. Was she cracking up? You get paid good, Bridget. Times are hard in Rapture. You want to continue to get that research funding, just accept what you gotta do for the check. She didn't seem to hear him, or she didn't care. She just kept smoking, sucking through the holder and gazing dreamily through the window at the two little girls holding the smoke till her words carried it out. They do not act so unhappy, the little sisters, but in their souls they, Germans, say, Schmerzenfrei. They feel the pain. Their souls? No such thing as souls, he snorted. There are stories. People on plasmids are seeing ghosts in rapture. Ghosts? He shook his head disdainfully. Lunatics. Where are you and Su Chong in battling the side effects of the plasmids? It was a key question for Fontaine. He figured the time would come when he'd need to use plasmids personally. Maybe a lot of them. She didn't respond. Fontaine felt a flare of anger and took her shoulder, turned her sharply to face him. Are you listening to me, Tenenbaum? She looked quickly away, stepping back, refusing to meet his eyes. Her voice was monotone, with perhaps a trace of amusement. Are you trying to frighten me, Frank? I have been to hell in my time. She got all dreamy again. I did not find tormentors there. More like kindred spirits. But these children... She looked through the window again. They awaken something in me. Something? Like what? She shook her head. I do not wish to speak of it. Ah, you wish to know about side effects. Yes, Adam acts like a benign cancer, destroying native cells and replacing them with unstable stem versions. The instability, it transfers amazing properties, but it is also what causes damage. The users, they need more and more Adam. From a medical standpoint, catastrophic, but you are a businessman. She gave her peculiar little smile. If you take away side effects, not addictive, perhaps. Not addictive, you don't sell so much. Yeah, but we need two strains of the stuff. The best stuff for people like me when the time comes, and the regular plasmids for everyone else. You work on that, Tenenbaum. She shrugged. She stared at the children, becoming dreamy again. After a moment, she murmured, One of the children. She sat on my lap. I, I push her off. She touched the glass of the window before going on, letting smoke drift slowly from her mouth as she looked languorously through the glass. I push her off. I shout, Get away from me! I can see the Adam oozing out from the corner of her mouth. She closed her eyes, remembering, her filthy hair hanging in her face, dirty clothes, that dead glow in her eye. I feel hatred, hatred, Frank, like I never felt before. 
bitter, burning fury. I can barely breathe, but Frank... She opened her eyes and looked at him for one surprising instant. Then I know it is not this child I hate. With that, Bridget Tenenbaum turned suddenly on her heel and strolled distractedly away, back toward the lab, trailing cigarette smoke behind her. Fontaine stared at her. She was cracking up. Maybe he should have her taken out, but she was too valuable, and Ryan would be making his move. Everything was almost in place. Mr. Fontaine! He jumped a bit startled by Su Chong's voice, turning to the scientist as he bustled up from the other direction. Christ, Su Chong, you don't need to sneak up on people like that. Su Chong is sorry. The hell you are. Listen, what's going on with Tenenbaum? She losing it or what? Losing it? Looking the same as ever, each hair in place, his glasses polished, Su Chong gazed placidly through the window at the sight that had so moved Tenenbaum. It was as if he were looking into a cage containing lab rats, which was, of course, just what he was doing. Ah, perhaps so. Su Chong sometimes thinks she loses objectivity. Speaking of nutty females, you follow up on that one I told you about for that special project? This was what he'd mainly come here for today. None of the assistants were in earshot. This was top secret. Yes. His voice was barely audible. You were clever to put the listening device in this Jolene woman's rooms. She spoke to one of her friends, a woman named Culpepper. This woman, Culpepper, she tries to educate Jasmine, talks to her about Ryan, to convince her he is the great tyrant, and so on. Yeah, Reggie told me. He went over the transcripts. You think he doesn't tell me everything first? Culpepper's turned against Ryan, and Jasmine Jolene's pregnant. Or maybe I should say Mary Catherine's pregnant. That's her real name. So, did you make her the offer? He bowed. Tenenbaum made offer. She accepts. Money so she doesn't need Ryan to live in exchange for the fertilized egg, Ryan's baby. She came to lab, Tenenbaum extracted diploid zygote. The what? Basically the kid, right? Pre-fetus? Su Chong bowed. Mr. Fontaine has it exactly. We got someone to bear the kid? Su Chong blinked. Who can bear kids? I cannot bear them, the kids, they... Su Chong, I need someone to have the baby and turn it over to us. Ah, all is arranged. So Ryan's bloodline, his... what do you call it? His DNA, yes. When new Vita chambers work, when security is DNA specific, Ryan's DNA will protect your... subject. You think the project is doable in the short term, Su Chong? Fontaine pressed. I mean, making it... What was it you called it? Accelerated development. Child growing faster. And then, the conditioning. That's the important part. The conditioning. Brainwashing. Kid has to respond to cues, like you said. You can do that. Yes, I believe so. My experiments confirm it. Su Chong used the reward system of the brain. Conditioned the organism. The human offspring do anything. Anything you desire of them. Anything. On cue. I mean, even something the guy never normally do. That's what we need, see? I need to know I can use this kid against Ryan when the time comes. I believe so, yes. Su Chong's eyes were shining. Conditioning. Mind control. That was his meat. It's what he gloried in. Especially if I have him very young. Okay, say you got him as a kid, and let's say he's got a puppy. Kids love dogs. You could make him kill his own dog. I mean, cute little puppy, one he really loved. Could you make him kill it with his bare hands? That'd be the real test. 
Su Chong nodded, showing his teeth in a grin. Very unusual for him. Yes, wonderful, is it not? Yeah, if it works. Fontaine felt a giddiness himself. It was a real grifter's ace, a primo con. Maybe the best bunko of all. One that would take years to unfold, but that was the beauty of it. The time lag would make it something Ryan would never expect. This way, if the Atlas project didn't pan out, he'd have another way to get to Ryan. He already had wealth and control over a great deal of rapture. But to have a conditioned little puppet waiting to do his bidding, it was a thrilling thought, a con carried out by life itself.